I am pleased to welcome you to the documentary Close to Closure, The Amelia Earhart Mystery. On June 18, 1928, a young Boston social worker flew aboard a yellow Falker F-7 airplane called The Friendship, owned by a prominent socialite named Mrs. Gust of London. Successfully crossing the Atlantic Ocean in 20 hours and 40 minutes, Amelia Hart rose to fame and fortune as the first woman to accomplish such a feat. But how did this indomitable aviatrix capture our fascination for nearly three generations? While viewing Close to Closure, the Amelia Hart mystery, you will be witnessing firsthand the latest piece of information that brings us even closer to understanding this most daring icon of the golden age of aviation, Amelia Hart. At the tender age of 10, while attending the Iowa State Fair in Des Moines, Amelia saw an airplane flying for the first time, climbing and spinning through the billowing blue sky. The crowd below gazed up cheering loudly at every maneuver it made. It was like watching a sparrow gliding freely across the sky on a warm spring morning. Amelia never lost that sensation to tower above it all, especially in the years to come when her home life began to unravel due to her father's drinking, her parents getting a divorce, and all the constant migrations that took place during her early years. Like a sparrow, Amelia wanted to glide and fly across the billowing blue sky, yearning for her own independence and endeavors. And then she could look out over the river and watch the birds fly uh, out over the Missouri Plain and wonder where they were going and wish that, that, that the river maybe was, you know, a river in, in, in Russia or a river in France or something like that, and that she could see all those places. So I, I think wanderlust uh, for her and for George was something that was instilled in her at a very early age. Her grandmother taught Amelia how to act like a lady, how to have poise, how to handle herself in front of people when she grew up, but also Amelia taught her grandmother that little girls should do a lot more than they had up until then. In fact, they should do anything the boys can do. And so Amelia devoted the rest of her life to prove that. Amelia Earhart was the first American woman flyer to be taken seriously as a pilot. Others that flew before her, such as the highly talented stunt pilot Ruth Law, were generally perceived to be something of an aberration or a novelty. An old friend of George Putnam's by the name of Hilton Rayleigh had overheard a conversation that a woman pilot was needed to assist in the transatlantic flight. Since George had known his way around in the business of expeditions as well as experience in aviation projects, he set out to find the right person. He met Amelia Earhart in April 1928 when an interview was arranged to discuss the possibility of her accepting the role of becoming the first female pilot to cross the Atlantic Ocean aboard the Friendship, piloted by Lewis Gordon and Wilmer Stoltz. She accepted the adventure, but was somewhat disappointed that she didn't actually get the opportunity to take over the controls. However, her popularity and fame upon landing in Southampton, England in June 1928 began a marketing campaign led by George Putnam, which made Amelia Earhart a household name, not to mention an aviation icon. Anyone who could do all those things certainly must have had some personality traits that were strong in her own right. And would someone who was that strong choose to be with someone who everyone thought was that awful? Amelia's name was lent to licensing agreements on clothing lines, luggage, magazine articles, and speaking engagements throughout the country. In addition, Amelia was invited to join Purdue University as a visiting counselor for women students. The university established a special fund for aeronautical research to outfit what Amelia called her flying laboratory, a Lockheed Electra twin engine plane. Right this way, Miss Earhart. However, was George Putnam behind Amelia's career or ahead of it? or just laying out the pathway. O'Hara Township is the site of the uh, airfield where Amelia Earhart crashed, uh, a small crash because of rough terrain at, at the field. And uh, George Putnam was with her. They were not married at the time. He was her publicity agent. You know, there's some controversy about my great-grandfather being overly overbearing or, um, you know, controlling her, but I'm, 
proud of him and that I think he really helped her gain attention and fame and um, helped to, well he was a publicist and he knew how to promote things that would be interesting to the public and I believe that's really what helped her become a household name. Yes, I was always impressed that nobody thinks she could do. Uh, I mean, when I say to do, to change the oil in the cars, do all these practical things, keep your equipment in good shape, which she did. And I can remember her very much telling my father that he turned the key on the car and the engine is running, let it run for a few minutes before you drive off so the oil can get lubricated and warmed up and go through all the parts of the machine that need to be taken care of. This sort of thing, technical. And she was very knowledgeable and knew these things. And you couldn't help, even as a kid, but be much impressed with what she could do and couldn't do. For the next four years, Amelia's life was anything but normal. She authored a book titled The Fun of It, set a woman's record for the fastest non-stop transcontinental flight from Los Angeles to New York, New Jersey, soloed a flight across the Atlantic, received the Distinguished Flying Cross from the U.S. Congress, and honored with the Harmon Trophy as America's Outstanding Airwoman. She and George were also frequent dinner guests of President Roosevelt and Eleanor at the White House. However, by 1935, Amelia sought out yet another adventure, a transoceanic flight. Focusing on the Pacific, she decided to plot out a route from Honolulu, Hawaii, to Oakland, California. There had been a prior flight from Oakland to Honolulu, but Amelia wanted to add her own touch to the challenge. So she decided to fly the entire route solo. No man or woman had ever attempted that feat, yet alone the opposite route. On January 11th, 1935, after covering the distance of 2,408 miles in 18 hours and 15 minutes, Amelia touched down her single motor Vega at the Oakland airport. She emerged triumphant from the plane amidst a crowd of cheering onlookers and newspaper reporters flashing photos of her as she waved and smiled to them. Amelia Earhart was passionate about flying. She did more to promote women in aviation than any other woman flyer during the 20th century. Amelia often reflected on the dangers of flying her single-motored Vega across the open expansions of water. As she began to plan and discuss with George the possibilities of arranging a world flight to crown her career, she knew she would need a much more powerful aircraft. Her goal was to obtain a multi-motored plane which would be able to cover more distance at a faster speed. But how? George and Amelia contacted everyone they knew, from industrialists to personal friends, to try to raise the funds. They also needed permission from President Roosevelt to make the world flight. And in 1927, long before he was president, Vincent Astor set this thing up, along with a few friends of his, at an, a, an apartment in Manhattan. It was at 34 East 30, 62nd Street. And it included uh, Theodore Roosevelt's brother, Kermit, Winthrop Aldrich, who was a banker, David E. Bruce, who was a diplomat, and I, keep, I wonder whether he was related to Robert E. Bruce, who knows, and also Nelson Doleday of the publishing fame, and also Rhinelander Stewart, who was a philanthropist. And the whole thing was conceived as an exercise in intelligence gathering. It was pretty low-level stuff. It was not hot, I don't think. And they would just swap the stuff they found out. They'd have a guest there who would spin them yarns. And they loved it. They loved it. They had a phone there, a mail drum. And it operated like a typical safe house, I suppose. <coughs> Gentlemen, I would like to open our discussion this evening with the ongoing affair that has focused the attention of our naval forces onto the South Pacific Islands. It has been confirmed that the Japanese forces are indeed expanding and the United States can no longer stand by and ignore it. Gentlemen, I believe I was the first to point out that Japan has, in fact, been a threat to us for many years. How so? They feel our military is weak, and that the policies we maintain of neutrality and isolationism will be our downfall. Also, Hitler is building up his army. Many countries that once maintained a military presence in the Pacific are, are abandoning their installations and returning home to support the war in Europe. While the cat's away, the mice will play, no doubt. And the Japanese have been very busy. We have information that the Japanese have, in fact, been building airfields throughout the Marshall Islands as far back as 1923. According to Brigadier General Bill Mitchell's 1925 report, right there, page 94, right in black and white, a clear warning. Basically, gentlemen, 
the Imperial Japanese Navy has built itself up so much in the past decade that it has now become a force with which to truly be reckoned. And Mr. President, we fear their forces will be at our country's doorstep before we know it. My God, they could invade us through Hawaii or California. We're sitting ducks. Our economy is still rebounding from the Depression. We still have bread lines in the streets. Now we're on the heels of a Japanese invasion. Our citizens don't want another war. They won't stand for it. Absolutely not. I don't want to war. Gentlemen, gentlemen, We've all brought to light some very serious issues. I concur we must protect our shores at all costs. But the last thing I want is for this country to be drawn into another war. Then the only way out, as I see it, Mr. President, is to get a foothold in one of those atolls ourselves. My God, there, there are the Marianas, the Carolines, Gilbert, Phoenix, and thousands of others in the South Pacific. Have we the manpower for that kind of coverage? Am I missing something here, gentlemen? What about the terms of the Treaty of Versailles? They never bothered to honor the Treaty of Versailles. Right now, as we speak, the Japanese armies are pushing China's borders right up Russia's ass. I would not doubt that for one minute. They want it all. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. We all know what the end result could be. The question is, how do we prevent it? I'm open to suggestions, a plan, something. Franklin Roosevelt came to the White House with an unprecedented background in intelligence. He had had a lot of experience in the Office of Naval Intelligence in World War I, and he was really fascinated with it. And interestingly enough, even though he had at his fingertips pretty darn high-grade signal intelligence, which means intercepted messages and things, he liked spies. He liked human intelligence. He really did, and his goal, well, what he really wanted to do was to have a vast network of agents infiltrating just anything and everything to tell him what was happening. Mr. President, if I may. Uh, please, Colonel Jones, you have our undivided attention. Commander Rob would agree that from a military standpoint, many of our past attempts to scout our territory in the Pacific have been failures. Yamamoto and his Navy watch every vessel, military or civilian, that sails anywhere near Truck, Saipan, Mealy, Howland Hall. We have learned we cannot go anywhere near them without suffering his consequences. We should also add to that any flyovers, Harmon. The only planes able to fly within Pacific airspace are the Pan American Airlines, and their route from Hawaii only takes them around the tip of South America to drop off mail. What we need is an aircraft to fly over key positions to see exactly what the Japanese Army and Navy are building. Commander Rob and I are certain that it is airfields and oil storage tanks. If we had an aircraft equipped with a military aerial camera taking pictures, flying over that territory, we would have undeniable proof of precisely what is transpiring. Yes, that's right. That's what we need. Yes. Uh, the problem, though, is that under the current mandates, uh, we cannot send military personnel out on a scouting mission, but uh, perhaps a civilian. Yes, that might work, but whom could we turn to? Somebody that no one would ever suspect, let alone the Japanese. Ah, where's Cedric Smith when you need him? Now he would think of someone. Mm -hmm. Now wait a minute. I read George Putnam's announcement in the New York Times the other day that Amelia Earhart is planning an around-the-world flight to cap off her career. Many people express disbelief that uh, Earhart would have flown a mission, but a world flight by someone like her was an absolutely irresistible opportunity, I think, for the government. When, just to simply update their maps, to get just a few pictures here and there of various places. Well, I don't know how far along they are in their planning, but it couldn't hurt to give George a call. More importantly, where are they getting their funding? You know, plane, fuel, manpower? That carries a pretty hefty price tag. Why not, Recruiter? She's already a national hero. She'll be able to keep us closely informed of her sightings at all times and shoot pictures. And who would ever question a woman like Amelia Earhart? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not me. <laughs> Knowing Putnam, he'll probably want to write a book about the entire affair. Amelia Earhart goes down in history as not only the first woman to cross the Atlantic, but to fly around the world. <laughs> no mistakes, gentlemen. 
want nothing to go wrong. Do I make myself perfectly clear? The American people must know nothing of this. Earhart is probably the best woman pilot around, but she'll need a navigator who knows that Pacific route. Now, Fred Noonan comes to mind. He's worked with the Office of Naval Intelligence. He has a good reputation with both aircraft and naval navigation. I'm all in favor. Any objections? Amelia assembled a crew of three qualified personnel to assist with the world flight. The plan was to depart from Oakland, California on March 20th, 1937, and land at Honolulu, Hawaii, where she would begin the first official leg of her flying west around the world. Some 29 scheduled stops were planned along the way. It was to be the flight of the century. Paul Mance was her technical advisor. He would be dropped off at Honolulu. Fred Noonan, an expert navigator who was very familiar with the South Pacific. He had flown Pan Am China clippers throughout the area. He would fly as far as Howland Island. Captain Harry Manning, whom Amelia met on her return to the U.S. in 1928 from her Atlantic flight with Stoltz and Gordon. He offered his services as a navigator whenever she needed one. He would fly with her as far as Bisbane, Australia. Amelia Earhart. She was to fly alone from Bisbane, Australia, back to the United States. The Lockheed Electra 10E was a two-motored aluminum plane. It was the state-of-the-art aircraft of its time, designed especially to endure distance, carry extra tanks of fuel, retractable landing gear, automatic pilot, a direction finder, two WASP senior engines, and a cruising range in excess of 4,000 miles. This was the plane of her dreams, and she knew it would get her job done. At daybreak, it was cloudy, cold, and rainy as Amelia, Mance, Noonan, and Manning gathered on the Luke Field in Hawaii for takeoff on March 20, 1937. As the Electra taxied down the runway, picking up speed, it began to sway left while tilting forward onto the right wing, just low enough to place the weight of the entire plane on the right wheel. Releasing the landing gear, the Electra collapsed onto its belly. Sparks and smoke flew up from under the plane in all directions until it came to a complete stop on the muddy grass field. The crew emerged slowly from the plane unhurt. To date, some claim the crash was caused by the Electra being overweight or mechanical failure, or even a tire may have blown out. The most damaging was the opinion of Captain Harry Manning calling it the Honolulu fiasco, placing the blame on the ability of the pilot. The people interested in getting close to that airplane and get inside of it, and that was not permitted at all. Literally day and night on her airplane for several months, when she started her muddy takeoff run, he ran alongside her uh, for the first part of the uh, takeoff. Was it Amelia's inability to handle the aircraft, or was there something more suspicious behind the mishap? In the spring of 1937, at Bay Farm Island Airport, where Amelia's Electra was being repaired, a young local boy by the name of Robert Myers would run errands for the workers and pilots. Amelia befriended Robert, and he soon became a trusted confidant of hers. He heard things that haunted him for the rest of his life. Meyer's personal log of Amelia's radio transmitted messages during the eight days after her Electra was reported missing was made public in his 1985 book titled, Stand By to Die. Hi, Robert. It's good to see you. Please, sit down. Have you eaten? Let me order you some snails and a nice glass of milk to wash them down. They're really fresh. I have a dentist appointment with Dr. Stevens this afternoon. Is he a good dentist, Robert? Oh yes, Amelia. My family and I have gone in on many occasions. I'd better get my teeth examined too. I've been meaning to do it for some time, but you know I hate doctors. Who the hell's that? Good afternoon, Miss Earhart. Mr. Noonan. I'm Lieutenant Green from Low and I. I have some landing clearance papers here for both of you to sign regarding your upcoming flight. Thank you, Lieutenant Green. Destinations. I haven't signed so many forms in my life. <laughs> May I have a copy? We'll have copies mailed to you as soon as all the signatures are completed, Miss Earhart. Good luck to you both. 
Thank you. I don't know, Fred. There is something fishy going on, and no one is telling us a thing. Ever since we returned from Hawaii, shadowy men have been visiting GP at our home. And when I ask him who they are, he gets angry and says it's no concern of mine. Even the bills have stopped arriving in the mail. I just know deep down in my soul that something is wrong. Do any of those men look at all familiar to you? No. Listen, Fred, if you want to back out of this flight, I'll understand. No. Amelia, no, you can't do this on your own. It's too dangerous. Even I wouldn't attempt to do this. I don't care how many people had planned it out for me. I'm going to get going. Wait, Robert. Robert, I know we've been dear friends for the past two months, and your friendship is important to me. And I know that you've heard a lot of details about this world flight that you were not supposed to know about. Robert, you must promise me one thing before we leave in a few weeks. I'll do anything for you, Amelia. Listen to me very closely. If anything should go wrong during our flight, you have to tell someone the truth about what was happening to us. Tell your mother, a teacher, the police. Are you sure you should be telling them this? I know, Amelia. I'll follow your flight by radio, and I'll be able to hear every word that you say. I'll be with you all the way from start to finish. Good. That's good, Robert. My bag is gone. It's getting hard. I'll see you. I'll see you, Fred. Good night. A succession of changes had already begun with the modifications to the Electra at the Lockheed plant in Burbank, California. Heavier landing gear, replacement of the damaged right wing, lengthening the V antenna on the top of the fuselage, two new WASP senior engines were installed, and a Fairchild aerial survey camera. Next, the direction of the world flight was changed. Originally, Amelia was to depart from Hawaii and fly over the Pacific. However, this time, the first leg of the world flight would depart from Miami, Florida, then proceed down to South America, across up to Africa, up toward India, then on to Asia down to New Guinea, then heading northeast across the Pacific Ocean with her destination of Hawaii and then on to California. With all these changes in place, was Amelia physically and mentally ready for such a long, grueling flight? Amelia Earhart had questionable piloting skills. She ground-looped her Lockheed Electra aircraft on takeoff during her first attempt to fly around the world. Amelia Earhart did not seem to do much flying other than to set records. That was really part of her problem. Amelia Earhart, it seems, spent too much time on the lecturing circuit rather than keeping up and improving her flying skills. Most pilots I know like to fly uh, rather regularly in order, to, in, other, in order to keep on top of their game. Uh, that's why I think in some aspects uh, she crashed uh, because she didn't practice enough. Again, I can't emphasize that Politan even today, you just can't get in and go, and then, then you shoot 2,300 miles. I didn't think she'd been all 10, 12,000 miles, and now she's, she's getting ready to go on this last leg, and she's tired, and she, the communications give out, and, and she gets lost, and the reckoning, and where, probably flew over the island. Amelia Earhart, it seems, was, was really not fully prepared for her round-the-world flight. She did not know how to use the radios that were on the aircraft, and actually had removed a trailing antenna to reduce the weight of the aircraft, which made a, had made a difference in being able to locate her exact position. Navigator Fred Noonan have been lost at sea and are presumed dead. My husband and I happened to be in a car on the highway going to an entertainment center the night that we heard of Amelia's crash. 
and we were very hurt, but we felt so positive that they would find her. And of course, we were disappointed when we didn't find anything right soon. All right, I think we can dispense with protocol, McRae. Please be seated. Mr. President, I have just received an urgent wire from Captain Miles of the Itasca station at Midway. Please, Harry, continue. Admiral King? A British plane has been shot down near Miliato by the Imperial Japanese Navy. At this time, it's uncertain if there are any survivors. The Itasca is en route to Miliato as we speak, sir. I'm sure that the British are en route as well. Earhart and Noonan had to have seen the Japanese ships as they approached the Gilbert Islands from New Guinea. What about the radio communications from them? That's where everything went to hell. Damn it, this wasn't supposed to happen. I want answers, I want answers now. Mr. President, the Itasca picked up several of Earhart's messages, but each was sent on a separate frequency and so badly garbled that the, uh, the radio man couldn't pinpoint her exact position. I'll bet my pension, the Imperial Japanese Navy heard every word she was saying loud and clear. But they knew exactly where she was headed. Probably from the takeoff at Ley, toward the Gilberts, then north up to the Marshalls. Well, if that's so, she blew the cover of the mission. How so? Well, don't you see? My God, by broadcasting the names of the Marshall Islands they were passing over, she gave away her position. It was Noonan on any of the messages. No, they didn't pick him up, sir. I'll I'll bet that he convinced her to turn in a southeasterly direction for a different vector. That's the logical course to take under the circumstances. Which would most certainly have gotten them out of a dangerous situation. Yes, but by then it would have been too late. Here's the southeastern position. Wheels up on Hull Island is the last part of the message the radio men could make out. Which perhaps makes that the destination they were trying to reach? That's what I think. Of course, the uh, Tasker's orders were to be stationed between the Gilbert Islands for any drop. She was so close to Howland, too. Dear God, what a tragedy. Well, we've had reports of typhoon conditions throughout the entire area for the last 24 hours. Well, I'm sure that didn't help the last leg of the flight, either. Noonan's flown the Pacific for years. He's no stranger to typhoons. But was Earhart? Weather? Japanese? British plane in the area? What else could have gone wrong? Get as many ships as you can in the direction of the Phoenix Gilbert Marshall Islands, Admiral King. Grace put out a press release that Earhart's plane is lost. The air and sea search is underway. Yes, Mr. President. Things are only going to get worse. I should never have gone along with this plan. I'm sure the Japanese have them both by now. Alive, hopefully. For how long? Spurred on by reports, rumors, and even a film titled Flight to Freedom, the interest and skepticism as to the fate of Amelia Earhart lived on in the hearts and minds of the American people. However, as the years progressed, the Japanese moved towards total domination of the South Pacific Islands. The most hostile command by Vice Admiral Chuchi Nagumo was delivered at 7.30 a.m. Sunday morning, Hawaii time, December 7, 1941. He ordered a striking force of 190 Japanese dive bombers, torpedo planes, and fighters to strike the American naval base of Pearl Harbor. Decoded cables sent by the Japanese government to its ambassadors in Washington were immediately brought to the attention of President Roosevelt at the White House. Gathering his cabinet in the House chambers, President Roosevelt carrying his rostrum, addressed Congress at 12.29 p.m. Since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Hearing the word infamy welded the country together in the first 10 seconds of his speech. Men, women, and children volunteered to do their part in the war efforts. Combat duty, food rationing, collecting tin cans, selling war bonds and stamps in the name of patriotism was the way of life during the war years. The American people united like never before until the war was won. 
George Putnam answered the call of his country by enlisting after completing officer's training school and the Air Intelligence School located in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Commissioned as a major in the Intelligence Division of the United States Army Air Corps, he was assigned to China to follow up on rumors that had been circulating about Amelia Earhart being the soft, sultry voice of the radio broadcaster Tokyo Rose. The theme of her messages were to confuse, mislead, and generally demoralize American fighting men. As an intelligence officer, Putnam's duty was to investigate such incidences through Asia and the South Pacific. Have her gone and not know exactly where she was, and not know if she was ever going to see her again, it was, was, you know, pretty torturous, um, I, I suspect. Um, he did everything in his power to, to find her. Um, he, he spent a lot of money, uh, and did everything he could think of to look for her uh, in every possible way, uh, including I mean, everything from possibly uh, going on a ship that was uh, chartered by Kermit Roosevelt and, uh, and his Astor uh, to go look for her uh, himself and to go to the uh, Marshall Islands to look for her, all the way to hiring or uh, to consulting psychics who said they knew where she was. Um, I don't think he left any stone unturned. While fighting in the Pacific Theater, some military personnel couldn't help but wonder whatever happened to America's aviation hero, Amelia Earhart, and her navigator, Fred Noonan, who before the outbreak of World War II had flown over many of the islands that were now being liberated from the Japanese. Amelia Earhart may have ditched. Um, yeah, after looking at pictures of the plane, I think this is entirely possible. Uh, my personal opinion is, uh, and I've said previously, that I would much prefer to stay with the airplane and ditch it. Now, uh, they would have had to do with a number of things, of course. If the ocean was really rough, you might give it a second thought. If you could recognize the ocean was really rough. Now, possibly, uh, which is not impossible, it's, uh, because you see the white caps, uh, and you can recognize that from a distance. The other uh, thing was their, uh, her ability as a pilot. Uh, she might have felt safer jumping out than trying to land in the ocean. Another possibility where they did she have gas where she would have complete control of the ditch, or did she, was she actually out of gas? Many young Marines witnessed first-hand experiences that haunted their souls for a lifetime. What they saw and heard, no one can take away from them. I was in the invasion of Saipan, the second Marine Division, and after the campaign, uh, a group of Marines were left there uh, to be transferred to another camp. And we were asked to look uh, for stragglers that would come down out of the mountains, Japanese soldiers, at night looking for food around Garapan and take them to a stockade on the beach or someplace there. And. Uh, during the daytime, we had really nothing to do because they weren't going to move. And we were sitting there hunting one day and uh, came on a government building in Garapan. And through the rubble, we found a safe that had been buried with the roof falling in on it. And uh, found that it was uh, a situation where had a, the doors had to come off it, and one of the boys was a demolition person, mm -hmm. and he packed it and blew the doors off the safe. Uh, consequently, we all went in after the dust cleared and uh, grabbed what we thought, I grabbed what I thought was a bag full of money, a leather bag, and ran off with it and opened it up, and lo and behold, it was full of Amelia Earhart's papers that had, uh, were bone dry. Uh, I might have been only 17, but I was in 38. She was supposed to crash the, the plane in the water, and they haven't found the plane or her yet. And these were bone dry. They didn't 
So uh, definitely something was wrong. Uh, Amelia Art did not <laughs> crash in the ocean. June 29, 2005. Dear Andrea Nyapis, I am sending you some pictures. Sorry so late. I talked to Mr. Wallach. I've seen the briefcase. I'm probably the one that recorded it. As four of our message center people were killed or wounded on landing, we were shorthanded. I did not see what was in the briefcase, but I was close to it for a couple of days. I did witness the naval officer sign for the briefcase. We recorded each article that came through our command post, and at the end of the month, all copies of messages and official mail that was recorded was put in a box made of 2 by 6 material and turned into Colonel Wallace, our regimental CO, so they are stored someplace. Marine Corps Archives. If I could be any help, let me know. I hope this will be helpful. Erskine Neighbors. I do know that she uh, was missing in 39. I didn't arrive out to Saipan until uh, uh, 1944. At that time, I did hear, in fact, I was told to keep an eye open anytime you're flying around over the island of Saipan, Tinian, in that general area in Rota and Guam and for any sign of an airplane. And these two guys were coming from here towards the plane and the one that had the bandolier of ammunition over his shoulder had the same white shirt on. Mm -hmm. That was Forrestal. Now someone told me it could never have been Forrestal because Forrestal would never carry a bandolier of ammunition over his shoulder. How could they say a thing like that? They say he would never carry a bandolier. How do they know what the heck he would do? Right. So, I mean, uh, no matter what I said or anything, people would cast, cast right, right. or something or other. So all of a sudden, they stopped walking, and I looked out here, and this guy, the photographer, was waving them back. So they turned, and they tried to run a little, and they went back to the hangar. And where were you at that point? Well, we were around Over on the plane. here. We were on the plane. Okay. And, over then the, and these two didn't see you? Huh? But they might have, but they might have thought we were part of this deal going oh, on. Oh, something, the because preparation. Because there were... Ten containers of gasoline right here. Uh huh. And, and Anderson uh, tried to do, he says, they smell like gas. So he went to dump it over. I said, don't dump it over. So uh, I went and I smelled it. It didn't smell like gasoline. It might have been some sort of fuel, I don't know. But one of the guys that I finally got some information from said that he was on a truck and him and two other guys and all of this gasoline and they sprayed it and dumped it all along the walls of the hangar on the inside. Hmm. He said they were going to set the whole thing on fire. Oh, they, you mean they burned it inside the hangar? No, they didn't burn it inside the hangar. He said that they took gasoline and poured it all along the walls of the hangar. Uh -huh. This was probably when the plane was in flight or something like that. They came in a truck, uh -huh. they were told what to do, and they did it. But when the plane landed, they couldn't get it into the hangar because of the flat tire, probably. Forrestal was keenly aware of the importance of publicity and how it could shape Americans' perception of the war and the enemy. He had control over military news and was in a position to suppress reports, especially looking beyond World War II to post-war Japanese-American relations. Amelia Earhart or her Electra could have hindered peace efforts into post-war international relations. Elgin and Marie Long claim that the line of position, 157-337, which is about 40 miles north-northwest of Howland Island, is the spot where Earhart and Noonan's plane ran out of fuel, thus forcing the Electra down, where it sank to the bottom of the ocean bed. In the Chater report, Elgin Long explains the findings. And the Department of Commerce was taken over by the Department of Interior. And, and, and so W.T. Miller was relieved, and, and the Department of Interior uh, appointed R.B. Black as Department of Violent Affairs uh, in Honolulu, and, and he took over from W.T. Miller. They went down together uh, on a cruise to introduce Black to 
how the operation worked, and Miller went along. And then Miller was sent out by uh, Gene uh, Vidal to help me and, and whatnot uh, to get the, get the flight off out of Oakland in March. And he, he was there uh, during the whole preparations for the flight and departure and whatnot, and then left soon afterwards. And then that was sort of the end of W.T. Miller's involvement in the media heart affair until she disappeared. And then he was very knowledgeable about the planning for the flight because he'd been in on all the original planning. And so he sent a bunch of official telegrams uh, to play New Guinea, uh, to uh, Sydney, and, and to various places. And at the time, he was on a trip, happened to be down in the Antipodes. And uh, uh, he uh, was on a ship at the, at the actual time that it happened, or maybe he just got back, I'm not sure the exact timing. But uh, he either was en route or just got back from the Antipodes when, when Amelia was lost. And he sent these messages to Sydney for help, and he actually had first-hand knowledge because he just met the people a few weeks before, and he knew who to, who to send to and where to send to, and he knew about Guinea Airways and, and all that. And uh, that was where how the Chater report, report was originated. It was actually sent by the request of the, of the chairman of the board at the Lola Gold Company in San Francisco to Mr. Joubert, the one in uh, Gold Company in Dubair, uh, uh, in Ley, and who related, of course, to their Guinea Airways, which was Eric Chater, to make a full report, which he did, eight pages long, and it was sent to San Francisco. But by the time the report got from Ley, everything was by ship in those days. It took weeks and weeks and months and weeks and got to Sydney and then it was relayed to San Francisco. At the time it got to San Francisco, Amelia who? I mean, and everybody forgot all about it and he took it and filed it. And they sent also a cablegram, but it cost, I believe, $5.80 a word to send a cablegram from Lay to San Francisco. And so they sent a 24 word or something cablegram. They asked the four questions, how much fuel, uh, how long did it take, what time to take off, and how long to expect to get there. He answered those four questions with nothing more, except he said a full report is coming to mail. We can never find a full report. Well, it was finally found. The Lola Gold Company was, was sold to a Canadian gold company, and they moved all the files to Vancouver, British Columbia, and there they sat in the basement for over 50 years. And one day, a gentleman who was head of communications for uh, the new gold company uh, was down in the basement going through a bunch of old dusty boxes looking for pictures of early gold mining days in New Guinea and he ran across the file and said a new Earhart and all the gold and in that file they found the Chater report and uh, Roy Blay of Lockheed and I went up to Vancouver and uh, uh, interviewed uh, and, and authenticated they were absolutely authentic, no question about it. Nobody under any circumstances could fake those messages. So the Chater report, both Roy Blay and I agreed were absolutely authentic. And that's that's a smoking gun. That, that told us what happened and as far as the weather and whatnot was concerned. It was all contained within the uh, Chater report. And that was the about 10 years ago, that was the find of the century as far as the new air was concerned. It allowed us to solve the mystery. Why did she run out of gas? Why didn't the gas run for another couple, three hours? Contained in the Chater Report file, explained why. Or could the smooth belly of the Electra keep it afloat long enough for Earhart to locate the correct radio frequency to make contact with the Itasca radio? In 1937, my father, Leo Bellarts, was the chief radioman on board the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Itasca. Now, the Itasca was stationed off Howland Island in order to assist Amelia Earhart in her round-the-world flight. Needless to say, she never made it to a Howland. But during that time, my father was in charge of all radio communications. In 1937, the further away 
the least you heard the voice. It's not like today's radio that you can talk to somebody a thousand miles away and they sing that they're in the next room. In 37, the closer you got to the person, the louder the voice came in. And on that faithful day of July 2nd, she was coming in so loud, my father actually walked out of the radio shack, cocked his ear and looked up and figured he could hear her because her voice was coming over the loudspeaker so loud and being an experienced radio man with noise and how radio plane would communicate with the ships, he figured she was within eye, sitting, eye distance of Howland Island. Needless to say, when he looked up in the sky, it was clear, nice, bright, sunny day, and no Amelia Earhart. During the radio transmission that she had with the Coast Guard Cutter, the, the radio men on board, which was uh, Radio Men Thompson, Galton, and O'Hare, they were very irate with uh, Amelia because she never stayed on long enough to communicate fully with, with the Itasca. They were really getting mad at her because she would say something and then cut the radio off and never waited for their reply. In fact, during the entire flight, Amelia Earhart only acknowledged one time ever hearing the Coast Guard Cutter and the radio men. And so they never did have established a good communications between the two. One remark that my father always remembered at that last transmission that he heard from her, he felt that she was just ready to go into hysterics. He said just a couple, little bit more, and she would have been screaming. He figured that she was on the point of breaking. And on the last transmission, where she said, wait, I'm online, such and such, he figured something drastic happened at that last moment. When she said, wait, something came up. She either ran out of gas, she might have seen an air, uh, a ship on the ground, up on the, uh, on the ocean, and tried to ditch the plane. Some are convinced that Amelia Earhart returned to the United States after the war and was given a new identity, that of Irene Bolam. Living out her life as a New Jersey resident, according to Joe Jervis, as described in his book written with Joe Class in 1970. The book I'm holding in my hand here is, uh, contains the, the research that I did in the Pacific with 14 separate investigations. And of course, the author is Joe Class, who's a partner of mine, and who uh, did uh, all the writing you know, for this book. My field is not writing, my field is investigation. Now, what's interesting about the book, Amelia Earhart Lives, is this. Published by McGraw-Hill in, in November of 1937. As a result of publishing this book, we got sued by the woman who we believe to be Amelia Earhart, Irene Bowen, for $2 million. We were in litigation in New York for five years. Joe Class had his attorney in California. I had mine in Nevada. And McGraw-Hill has their own attorneys. Anyway, with all the negotiation going on and with this, we came to the point in five years that we wanted this matter settled. You know, it hadn't been settled yet. So we requested a hearing before the judge. And we got the hearing. And what we wanted was uh, an assurance that we either pay this woman two million dollars or dismiss the case. We don't, Joe Class and I do not have two million dollars, but McGraw Hill does. They've got a ton of money. They're the largest book publisher in this country. Now, one thing that is significant is this is that we held a press conference when this book came out, Joe Class and I, on the top of the Time and Life building, the top floor. And we had uh, uh, kits for each one of the reporters that were there, radio, television, other people. And we gave our background on our investigation, and spoke about a lot of evidence that we had. Four days later, the woman we believe to be a millionaire, Irene Bowen, held her press conference. And if you saw the press conference, the pictures of it, 
Shishka Abo and holding it upside down like this. Well, anyway, what it boiled down to was this. All we requested in order to settle this matter is that Irene Boland be fingerprinted privately in front of the judge without any attorneys for either side present. And what this would do is either prove or disprove that you're Irene Boland. I mean, that Irene Boland is a media artist. At that point in the litigation, what it came to was the entire episode was dismissed. In other words, Irene Bolum did not want to be done. She didn't want to be fingerprinted either. When our book came out, Irene Bolum was inaccessible. We sent her a copy of it before it came out, a copy of the book. No comments to anybody, not to us, not to anybody. And then the book came out, and the whole press world descended on Irene Bull. And she refused to talk on the phone to any of them for three days. Three full days. The only thing that happened was a voice would come on with a phony French accent saying she was the maid. And that Mrs. Bolum wasn't there. Well... When she did come out, she had the biggest press conference since Lindbergh, and everybody was expecting her to admit she was Amelia Earhart. The whole press corps was convinced by then because of her, her stonewalling them for three days. And instead, she held my book upside down, threw it down on the floor in front of every TV audience on earth, stomped on it with her right foot, called it a fraud, a hoax, a cruel hoax, she said, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I was McGraw Hill wouldn't let us go over to the press conference. They were our publisher, and I was sitting there watching it on television. I wanted to go over there, but they didn't want a confrontation like that. My her on television, and I was absolutely flabbergasted. And I actually was kind of uh, I I was so in love with Amelia Earhart. And I thought, by God, if she doesn't want to come out, we thought we were going to help her come out. Maybe she made a promise or something not to reveal herself, that we would get her back so she could receive the recognition that she deserved. And instead, she pulls this big stunt, and I said, that's the way Amelia Earhart. I thought, God damn it, look at her. Look at her guts. <laughs> By 2003, Colonel Roland Reinick begins to apply forensic studies of Earhart's photography. Techniques that are unveiled right before your very eyes. I have facts that will prove that Amelia Earhart survived her last flight, that Amelia Earhart survived the war, that she came back to the United States after the war under a new identity. This is the picture of Amelia Earhart taken in 1933 and Irene Bolum taken in 1965. We made an overlay of Amelia Earhart and put it over the features of Irene Bolum. And there you have almost identical facial characteristics. This is Amelia Earhart. That's Irene Bolum. The overlay, they're identical in every way. It's not just the facial characteristics that we looked at. We also looked at the hand size and the arms and the height and the foot size of Amelia Earhart and Irene Bolum. They're identical. And we also looked at handwriting. On the right chart, you'll see the handwriting of two of them, of Irene Bolum and Amelia Earhart, almost identical. I've never been more convinced that Irene Bolum and Amelia Earhart are, in fact, were, in fact, the same person. When the anthropologists, the forensic peoples, looked at the overlays, looked at all the other factors that we have amassed, they came to the same conclusion that these two people were indeed the same person. After looking into the story and not believing it at first, I decided to try to apply aspects of forensic science comparison study between Amelia Earhart and the woman who was suspected of being the former Amelia Earhart, or Amelia Earhart Incognito. 
And I know that without ascertaining that the woman who was suspected of being the former Amelia Earhart, without ascertaining that she actually was the former Amelia Earhart, I can tell you that there is a forensic duplicity to be recognized that is something that still is unrealized today. You know, I, I just think it's, you know, it's without merit. And in any event, one can argue um, uh, interminably, uh, it, it remains pure conjecture. DNA did not come on the scene until the mid 80s in England and late 80s over here, so. In the waning days of Thomas Devine's life, he received by mail a letter from Art Beach confirming what Devine swore he had witnessed in Saipan as a young army postal clerk in 1944. The letter was then sent by Devine to Andrea Neapis to include in her documentary, Close to Closure, The Amelia Earhart Mystery, letting the world know just one more piece of the truth. Art Beach, 224 2nd Avenue South, Grable, Wyoming, 82426. August 10, 2003. Dear Sir, I had an uncle who spent a lot of time in the Navy and was in some sort of secret service, OSS I think. He died in the 60s. Not long before he died, he told my dad how he was sent to a task force about to invade Saipan. He was to recover what he could of Amelia Earhart, bring her back if she was alive, and destroy everything if she was dead. Fred Noonan was already dead. He recovered her diary and some other papers. He saw her plane flying twice during the day while getting the papers. He went to the Admiral and the plane was put in an empty hangar with guards on the doors. Late in the day, he went to the hangar and dumped two five-gallon cans of aviation gas in and on the plane and lit it. He went back to the hangar the next morning and had a bulldozer push what was left of the plane into the pile of Jap planes and junk that was there. He had the cat walk over the pieces and push them into the pile and cover it. The plane had Navy radios in it. They were sending back information on a Jap buildup in the Pacific. Jap fighters forced them down and held them on Saipan. The government not only knew they were there, but sent a man there to hide or destroy all sign of them. Sincerely, Art Beach. Tom Devine received this letter a few weeks ago. For me, Amelia was always an embodiment of American spirit. I was born in December 23, 1937, and Amelia died. Her plane went down, well, we assume she died, in the fall or the summer of 1937. So I feel sometimes Amelia Earhart's spirit is what got me going into flying. And I think that that could be one of those little things that you just think about every once in a while, that maybe Amelia Earhart's spirit is inside me, and that's why I've always enjoyed flying, and I just, I love the adventure of it, and I think that's what she did, too. So, my opinion would be that searching for a plane that's been lost for 65 years is useless. Finding it will tell us nothing, and the money should be spent on a better cause.